We start around this time and have a pretty informal discussion today. And we have a lot of time, so we can also at one point, you know, you can go and get your coffee and come in and out. So this is supposed to be very informal and fluid. But first of all, thank you for joining me. And our session is titled, How You Build Your Research Program. So um, I thought I'll give a few introductory um, remarks. And I really want to have um, an informal conversation with everybody. And maybe then we can also go around the room very quickly and have brief introductions, who you are, what group you're working with, and whether you're already running some research programs or whether you're just sort of seeking input and getting some ideas. Um, how to get off the ground. So my name is Amelie Gubitz. I'm one of the many program directors at the NINDS. And the disease areas that are in my portfolio include um, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. You may also know this disease as Lou Gehrig's disease, as well as Kennedy's disease, which is another adult onset motor neurodegenerative disease, and then also um, hereditary spastic paraplegias. And um, what I wanted to um, sort of mention when we start our conversation is that I think that nonprofit groups can really be tremendously effective in kicking off and running um, a research program in their disease areas. And I think sometimes perhaps NIH may be the biggest funder of your disease dollar-wise, although you probably often think that NIH should do a lot more. But I think your advantage is that you may be a lot more flexible than the federal government, and you can react faster and be a little bit more nimble than we sometimes um, are. And I think these are really tremendous strengths and advantages that you can utilize to augment and enhance what is already in happening at NIH. And then the other um, thing that I wanted to um, briefly point out, I think there is oftentimes the impression in the community and in the outside that NIH sets specific um, research budgets for diseases at the end of the fiscal year because we have all these numbers and you know this is what you know you probably would expect but I wanted to explain a little bit that NIH actually works very differently so um, the investment of NIH in a given disease area is mostly controlled by the overall appropriation that we get from Congress. So that's one important factor, of course. It's the overall budget. And then secondly, um, it's simply the number of um, high quality, exciting, meritorious applications that we receive in a disease area. Because we can only fund what is, also, uh, what is submitted to us. And how it works is at NIH, so um, the applications come in and everything gets peer reviewed. So we don't just pick grants that we want to fund. Everything goes to expert panels. They look at the grant application and then give scores. So it's basically like in school, you get a grade. And um, um, these, um, these committees of experts that review these, uh, these applications are organized in panels that have a specific research emphasis or a disease area emphasis. So for example, when a grant comes in that focuses on research on Lou Gehrig's disease, there's no study section or expert panel that will just um, focus on this one disease. It goes typically to study sections that also um, review other related disorders. So a grant on ALS will um, be compared side by side with a grant that perhaps focuses on Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease. And ultimately, what um, gets the best scores and then gets funded is the best science. So it's not that reviewers decide we want to fund five grants on Lou Gehrig's disease and five grants on Huntington's disease. They decide that they want to fund the best science. So what is really important to stimulate um, the research activity in your disease is to help your community um, also to write very competitive um, applications that will then do well in the NIH system through peer review. And I think there's actually a lot that um, private group can do to sort of energize um, their field and enhance the quality of the science that is coming into NIH. And I think that's really an area where you can do a tremendous lot for your um, community. So people are walking in, but what I thought would be very um, helpful at the beginning is to um, 
briefly go around the room and have everybody just quickly give their first or their full name and say which group they're affiliated with and whether they already run a research program. So maybe Jane, you start. She's one of my colleagues. Hi, I'm affiliated with NINDS. I'm a program director. I oversee the brain tumor portfolio, which is a shared portfolio with NCI. I've been at NINDS for nine years. And before that, I was at NCI. I'm working with lots of different advocacy groups, both for brain tumor and for other cancer types. And I also was oversaw the tuber sclerosis and neurofibromatosis portfolios at one point in time. So have a cancer angle, but um, hopefully can contribute a little bit about just my interactions with the cancer world. Good morning. My name is Lauren Stiles. I'm uh, the president of Dysautonomia International. We're a very young patient um, advocacy group. We've been around for just about two years, and we've funded maybe $66,000 in research, which is not that exciting for diseases that have a lot more money. But for uh, the conditions that we study, um, it's probably a lot. <laughs> so we're hoping to raise more, and we're very actively engaged with our researchers who study autonomic disorders, giving them ideas on what we'd love to see them research, and um, giving them a lot of patient input into how they design their studies. So thanks for having us here. My name is Jeff Thomas. I'm from the National Disease Research Interchange. Um, we are a research program vetting group. Um, we're partly funded by NIH, but um, as an example of what we do, we partnered with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation about nine years ago to create a network to capture the explanted lungs from transplant patients who are undergoing um, transplant for their CF. So they took those lungs, created ciliated epithelial airway cells, and then used that for their compound development. Um, we have projects with like ALS groups. Um, to recover either post-mortem or um, tissues in tandem with um, uh, surgery. Um, I'm Richard Allenson. Good morning. I'm the CEO of the Cerebral Palsy International Research Foundation. We're a 50-year-old organization that had originally been part of United Cerebral Palsy. Um, we're a little different in terms of that we actually are giving dollars to a lot of researchers around the country to, you know, seed grants and, you know, young PI grants. And then we're now working with Kennedy Krieger on some white matter projects, and we're also working with Columbia on some pain management projects. But you know, we have a couple of million dollars a year, but the NIH sp spends only 18 million on cerebral palsy, you know, out of a 30 billion dollar budget. So you know, one of the things that we're trying to focus on is how to work more closely with the NIH. Ali, my wife, is a cancer researcher who was NIH funded, and before this job, I had created technology for people with cerebral palsy for speech devices and also for kids who have a thing called specific language impairment and have gotten an SBIR and an STTR grant in the past through the NIH and served on the advisory council of the NIDCD. So this is incredibly exciting to see all the work that's going on and all the different approaches to, you know, pushing what is essentially a shared agenda. So thanks. Thank you. Um, my name is Lynn Jakeman, and I am a program director at NINDS. I've been there for almost a year now. And um, I manage the spinal cord injury and the peripheral nerve regeneration portfolios scientifically. I come from The Ohio State University, where I was a researcher for 18 years. And I started my research program, actually made that jump from being a postdoc funded by my boss to a beginning research scientist um, through the, the generosity and the foundations, um, writing my first grant that probably never would have swum anywhere at NIH um, and being funded by, by foundations and smaller organizations to help me make that first step that then led to an academic career. Thanks. I'm Geraldine Bliss, and I chair the Research Support Committee of the Fallon McDermott Syndrome Foundation. And we have a research portfolio that includes our patient registry and our PCORI project, which Megan O'Boyle told you about yesterday afternoon. We also fund some, we have funded some basic and translational fellowships. This year, we're shifting our portfolio to more of a clinical research focus, and we'll be um, trying to stimulate the, addi the addition of some new sites to the rare disease clinical research network. Um, 
So all of that really amounts to about $100,000 to $150,000 a year for our research portfolio. The real way we're making a difference is just through our support of young investigators and project and scientists applying for projects. We write a lot of letters of support. We get involved. We talk to the program people at um, all of the institutes that are funding our work. And um, things like we organize a symposium each year, and to that we make a lot of travel stipends available to young, just to support the development of young investig investigators. Good morning. I'm Jason Crosby with the Interstitial Cystitis Association, and we have a uh, small uh, pilot research program. We fund, I think, three this year, and it was, we give about 25000 It's just trying to get um, you know, people kind of just get them started. Usually it's younger investigators, and they've been doing that for, I think, almost 30 years. So, because we've been around since 1984, so. Hi, I'm Megan Mott. I'm with NINDS, a uh, special assistant to Dr. Koroshitz, and I am just here to listen. Hi, I'm John Coakley. I'm with the Kennedy's Disease Association. That's a neuromuscular disease where your muscles are wasted and gone. Um, we uh, are small. Uh, we have nobody paid. We're scattered around the country with a board of eight people. And uh, this year, we will give away $100,000, which is a second year in a row. And we'll give it to investigators working on something for a cure for KD, Kennedy's disease. Good morning. I'm Mark Beck with the CEO of Nevis Outreach Incorporated. Um, primarily a skin disease, but with a very confounding neurological complication uh, in some patients. And uh, our organization has existed for 17 years. We gave our first research grant uh, when we were about two years old, and since then we've issued maybe 12 or 15 grants small grants uh, for basic science and epidemiology, totaling uh, a little over $1 million. Hi, I'm Joanne Odenkirch, and I'm from the Office of Clinical Research. Um, I'm responsible for the Common Data Elements Project. In addition, I've got a portfolio of ethics of clinical research. I also um, have some clinical trials and some clinical research in various um, diseases and I'm responsible for um, overseeing some data safety monitoring boards for some clinical trials and do a mishmash of other things as well. Hi, I'm Ann McGinnis. I'm president of the Catacil Association, also known as Cure Catacil. And Catacil is an acronym for cerebral autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy. And um, we are a very new organization. We've only been in existence two years. Um, we um, are aimed at bringing awareness, education, and research to the medical community. Uh, we have, are very small at this point. We are trying to raise funds for research. We um, have only a small amount of money to donate towards research, but we did donate a $4,000 scholarship to a, a a research student at a Harvard uh, University, and um, he did a summer internship. And um, we need help <laughs> in getting uh, grants and um, more money to do research. Hi, Beth Bernaleo at the Parkinson's Disease Foundation. I manage the research programs. Um, we've been around since 1957, and we give roughly about $5 million in research every year. It's largely basic research, but we do fund a little bit of translational, and we invite all types of ideas. Um, so we just have our scientific board um, reviews all of them. We have um, some different programs. We have research centers at Columbia University, Weill Cornell Medical College, and Rush. And these are sort of larger long-term funding to give flexibility to uh, teams of researchers to be able to go in whatever direction they want in Parkinson's research. And then we also have some young investigator awards. We have postdoctoral fellowships for neurologists and basic uh, scientists, as well as a movement disorder um, fellowship that we've um, 
also fund so that we can keep in the pipeline specialists that will be able to treat Parkinson's. Um, we also have summer fellowships to get uh, students interested in Parkinson's research, so that's for about 10 weeks over the summer. And we also have travel awards for people to present their um, research at different uh, PD-related conferences. Hi, I'm Jenna Kajnitsky at the Hydrocephalus Association. Um, Don Mancuso went over sort of our research portfolio yesterday, but briefly we have given seven Mentored Young Investigator Awards and three um, Basic Science Awards, and then we have two clinical research networks that we fund. Good morning, I'm Eileen Miller with the Hope for Hypothalamic Hamartomas, and I'm also a parent of a son who has that condition. It's a rare brain tumor that causes uh, seizures and other complications. We are about five years old. Um, we are virtual. We have all volunteer uh, board members that basically operate the organization. We've been focused primarily on support to date. We um, are eager to get a research program off the ground. To date, our research program has consisted of one $5,000 grant to an individual researcher, as well as supporting a symposium for, an international symposium for researchers on HH to begin to set an agenda so we can be thoughtful about where we want to put those resources um, and also to begin to raise those resources to support that research. Hi, I'm Cynthia Oviet. I'm the science coordinator for the AT Children's Project. AT stands for Ataxia telangiectasia. It's a rare genetic disorder that strikes children. It's a multi-system disorder, but it's primarily characterized by uh, progressive cerebellar degeneration, immunodeficiency, and increased um, propensity for cancers, especially uh, leukemias and lymphomas. So the AT Children's Project has been in existence since 1993, and its goal and mission is to find life-improving therapies or a cure for AT. So the first thing that the founders did was establish um, a two-tiered um, peer review system for grants, because that's our goal, is to fund research. We fund it internationally, and um, we fund basic science, translational, clinical um, studies and trials. We've shifted, we've kind of de-emphasized basic research a little bit, and um, though we will provide seed funding for that, and have gone more towards the translational and clinical, and we also fund a clinical center at Johns Hopkins Hospital and Tom Crawford who, I, who you might have heard yesterday, he's our pediatric neurologist at the AT Clinical Center. Hi, I'm Bonnie Ayers, and I work at the Sturge Weber Foundation. I'm not involved in our research program. Karen Ball usually is here, um, but I am helping out with the registry. Um, we did have a breakthrough with Sturge Weber Research last year. We're part of the Brain Vascular Malformation Consortium, and they found the cause, the gene mutation that causes Sturge Weber. So that was very exciting, and it was like finding, from what we understand, a needle in a million haystacks. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alex Sierra. I'm from the American Brain Tumor Association, and um, I manage the research grant portfolio there. We've been around for about 40 years, and we've given about $26 million in research. We've got about 250 fellows uh, in our uh, database and um, a number of translational uh, grants and discovery grants. We also offer a medical student summer fellowship also to encourage them to get into brain tumor research. Um, thanks for having us. I get to go first? Okay. <laughs> That's what happens when you bring your spouse. I'm Don Hobson with PMD Foundation, which is short for Palaisius Merzbacher, or if you're German, Palaisius Merzbacher. Um, I'm German. It is an ultra rare, we know of about 250 patients in the entire U.S. Over the last 15 years, we've raised approximately $400,000, of which 350 has gone toward research, both basic and wherever we can go to determine the severity of various genetic components, and um, mostly um, proof of concept studies. We have funded one recently an RFA two years ago for $100,000, which has succeeded in taking skin fibroblasts and generating iPS cells and correcting the stem cells for oligodendrocytes. That's going into now a study, I won't mention where, to inject those and test them on a mouse model, which is significantly, she can talk about that, um, it mimics and is in fact the uh, human component of the <coughs> gene. So you can talk about the research. I'm Grace Hobson, and 
uh, Don's spouse, and also I'm on the scientific advisory board of the PMD Foundation, um, and I'm uh, principal research scientist at uh, Nemours Alfred I. DuPont Hospital for Children, and I work on Polycystic Merzbacher disease, obviously. Um, and I just wanted to say that, like I heard over here, um, it was uh, family-run foundations that actually got my research off the ground. I had worked on PMD for a number of years before the PMD Foundation really was formed and, and got going. But once it did, and um, uh, another um, family organization, the Kylan Hunter Foundation, uh, supported my initial research uh, that gave me the preliminary data to get NIH grants. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what happens, I'm like 10 years out from that now. And sometimes the, the people on the board of the PMD Foundation kind of forget that the PMD Foundation was instrumental in getting that going. So I think you kind of need to, you know, really stay in touch with your researchers and um, um, kind of bask in the glory of, you know, what, what they are able to accomplish um, with the initial funding that they got from, from the uh, organizations. Not forget about that because you can get kind of lost in the day-to-day -day and um, um, think you're not getting anywhere when you really are. I think we have everything. Mona, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? You joined late. We have one more program director in the room. Or just speak loud. Hi, everybody. I'm Mona Hicks. I'm um, a program director that has been overseeing the uh, tyrannic brain injury research portfolio at NINDS. So thanks for coming to this and gives us an opportunity to meet mm -hmm. with you. So I think it's really fascinating to hear from all of you who are already running um, research programs how catalytic these seed funds can be. And I think there's really sort of two different flavors of seed funding. I think one really important um, aspect of this is to bring the young investigators into your research in disease area and get excited and um, so you can, you know, um, fund postdoctoral grants or um, principal investigators who are just starting their labs. That's always a very challenging time in their careers. So any type of funding, I think, at that career stage can be absolutely cat catalytic. And then often investigators really commit their career to research on your disease. And I think it's also important um, if you um, give grants to perhaps a little bit more established investigators, pick strong mentors. Think about, you know, their um, history of, you know, bringing young students into their labs and the, the young students then starting their own um, research careers. And I think another thing that foundations can sometimes also do really well is um, to bring perhaps a more established investigator from a slightly different disease area to your area because there are often um, um, shared molecular themes or sh shared um, research questions between diseases that should be um, looked at. So if you can bring an expert from a different field to your field, that can also be really enriching and, um, again, then be very catalytic. So um, what, I have, what I put up here earlier today is um, that at NIH we try to be really transparent. I think, you know, NIH is a big place, 27 institutes, and one thing also to um, not to, um, forget, sometimes it's more than one NIH institute that may be um, responsible for your disease. So for instance, for ALS, it's actually 10 different institutes that fund ALS research. And you probably, I don't know, have you all seen this website? It's our NIH reporter website, and this is the section where you can sort of look up various diseases. There are 237 different categories. It's mostly diseases, but also research themes. And it just gives you the dollar numbers, and it's hyperlinked, and you can actually then look up individual grants. And I think um, that can also be very helpful as you try to build a research program. So this is really in the weeds. And I know there are a lot of acronyms, and it's very technical and complicated. 
but um, I think it's very informative. And then you can see, for instance, this is the list of all the active ELS grants. And for instance, there are also a, kind, a couple of grants from the National Institute of Aging or um, the National Institute of Environmental Health Services that looks at ELS grants that look at environmental risk factors, for instance. So I think this is a, a very useful tool that can empower um, nonprofit, um, non for profit groups to learn what is happening at NIH and how you can enhance it. And I think it's sort of the idea a little bit about the gap analysis that was mentioned yesterday a number of times. Um, I think Sharon Hesley said that very eloquently. You should, you know, think about a landscape analysis and then really see what are the gaps. And maybe there are some riskier areas that you may want to fund because NIH is perhaps still a little bit too um, conservative or the feel or reviews feel the research isn't quite ready yet. So again, you can be pretty catalytic here. Um, I think, Jane, you had some good examples from your disease areas, how the groups have brought in, you know, young investigators and other investigators from the field. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I know you stood up at one point. Yeah, or I so. guess, um, uh, <laughs> I think it, most of the um, relatively, I'm not sure if I'm turning it on or turning it off. Most of the, re it's on, right? Most of the relatively, um, new foundations do start focusing on um, early stage sort of investigators because if you can get them into your disease field, they may stay there for their entire career. So a lot of them are giving C grants for, for early stage investigators. Um, I have to say that I've seen one um, foundation sort of evolve over time. I'm going to go slightly off that topic. Okay. The Cordoma Foundation, which I was just really impressed that it started with a mom and a and a son who had a chordoma about, I think, five years ago. Very rare disorder, like 400 cases in the country per year. And um, I was just, uh, I didn't think they would get so incredibly far in five years. So when I first met up with them, you know, I was saying cautionary notes, like, you know, it's going to be slow. You know, you have to sort of build. A couple projects have to sort of come on board, either in the NIH space or in the foundation space where you have, you know, a little bit of research going on and then people will tag on to that and it will grow from there. And uh, what they did just over five years was amazing. The head of the, the foundation is now the son who's in his young 20s. His name is Josh Summer. I think he's been on the cover of Forbes magazine. He's one of the, you know, movers and shakers who's under 30 in the foundation world. And the, some of the things that they had going for them. So the very first meeting that I went to, they had Francis Collins there. So for whatever reason, they had a connection to Francis Collins. And that drew investigators into the meeting. So I mean, there's always political circumstances behind almost a lot of, you know, success stories. But that was amazing. And I didn't realize that just having him there really was a draw to get people interested in the disorder. They focused on a couple very immediate priorities. So you talked about like sort of building your registry and getting blood samples. So they said, we need cell lines. We need some kind of tumors. We need chordoma tumor cell lines and we need models. We need animal models because if you're going to move therapeutics forward, that's what you need. So they just focused on a few very small priorities. And over, like I said, the five years, you can Google them. It's just amazing what they've done. So I was just really startled that two people alone, and actually the mom is no longer involved, so this is one very young man who has been able to take a disease that is so incredibly rare and do something super significant for it. So um, I guess uh, uh, when I talk to a lot of people, if you're dealing with a really small foundation, and I know you talked yesterday, it's like trying to partner with people who are doing so something similar, or a disorder that's very similar to the disorder that you're um, representing, uh, try to, d there was another lady who said, she's not in the room, who said, you know, don't reinvent the wheel, go yeah. and figure out how other people have, have moved projects forward. So I can answer specific questions. Something that I've noticed in the, in the um, tumor world is I, there, I have questions about, uh, you know, how many foundations out there are enough or too much 
for a particular tumor type. So I've seen <coughs> battling foundations. And is that really moving the field forward or is it inhibiting it? And I have to just say from my experience, if you seeing, observing the, how the foundations work, having a loud and sort of singular voice may be better than having many small voices. So I'm specifically thinking about the Ovarian Cancer National Alliance. It's a very large group of women who have been treated with cisplatin. And that is not a fun drug to be treated with. And um, they've been close to death and come back. And they are an incredibly, you know, just unified, very loud group. So my question for a lot of foundations is, you know, how much partnering are you trying to do to sort of move the field forward? Because I, just from what I viewed, I oversaw different types of tumors. Ovarian cancer was one. It's a very, it's a low incidence disorder. Breast cancer was another one. Um, brain tumor, melanoma. And how the foundation sort of functioned also related to, I think, sort of how, and I'm not allowed to lobby, but sort of responses through Congress and everything as to how you sort of rec get recognized. So I think that's really critical, is just to see if you can partner with others that, you know, mm -hmm. do something similar. And I guess I should stop now, because it's probably I enough for me. And I see already point. some hands yeah. coming up, and I always have a comment. Sure, or comment about yeah. of a sneaky way so they're, they're not exactly disclosing what they're doing yeah. precisely and I wonder if NIH can do something to compel like if you're working on certain genes list what those genes are not just autism or just epilepsy be specific about what you're doing because otherwise we're it's hard for us to find out so and it's a caution for all of you guys too when you're searching NIH reporter don't just look yeah. for your gene name or whatever or for your disease name yeah, look I, for all of the related conditions because those those grants are hidden in there I, I think that's a really good um, comment I think there are some issues with sort of the confidentiality issue with unpublished research Re um, investigators do sometimes hold back and unfortunately we can only share with the public what's available in the abstracts and I have to admit sometimes they're very general and it's, you know you don't really get all the specifics I still do think and that's why I put this page up now and um, you know do connect with your um, program director we're not going to sort of you know tell you all about the grants but I think we can give you a little bit context to what you can see at NIH reporter and I think that will already help you. And you know, I do a lot of portfolio analyses. I think all of us do. We can also then tell you, you know, there's a lot of activity in this area, but we don't see a lot of activity in this area, and maybe this is where your group could help. So I think we, if we have this dialogue and this conversation, that helps us and it will help you. So I always encourage you. And it's actually interesting, so in the ALS arena, there are over 10 non-for-profit groups, and some of them, they're very interactive, and I have calls with them basically on a weekly basis. And with others, they're a little bit, you know, and they're less interactive, and that's sometimes a little harder for me, and I also am, want to encourage the groups themselves to partner between them so that there's no redundancy and that they know what the other group is doing so they can complement one another. And the one thing I want to do very quickly, um, show you at our very busy website so you can find us and to find people, and um, oops, wrong click, so it's here. And so here um, you have all the um, program staff, so we are in the extramural part of the um, institute. You click here, and then it, you click deeper and deeper, and finally program directors like me, are, you can find them on this list, and we are, we are organized in different teams, so they have scientific themes like neural environment or channels and circuits. So I'm in the neurodegeneration team, so this is the four of us. You can click on us, and then it'll tell us which disease we handle, and there's our email and our phone number. Well, here we don't have the phone number, but emails work better anyways, so feel free to always reach out to us if you have questions, because if we don't hear from you, we can't reach out to you because we don't know where you are. And I always find it really helpful to sort of interact with the foundations. So I saw a few hands up earlier. Go ahead. 
Um, you had the website up earlier with the uh, disease category yeah, funding listing. Yeah, I can go listing. back to that. So I, had, I found that about a year ago when I was first starting the organization, trying to find out how much research funding is going towards um, postural orthostatic tachycardia yeah. syndrome, which doesn't make the list. Yes. So then I tried to look for it under you know, other names it might be called or a broad category. I can't find anything. So you know what you need to do, and this is pretty, um, so there are only 237 um, categories. Right. So of course, there Not are many more diseases. So, but you can go to the home page, mm -hmm. um, just to the reporter, and then, so it's this um, website, and you can do keyword searches, text search, put your disease here, do the search and see whether you find, whether you get any hits. That's sort of the only way you can do it in terms of, getting to NIH-funded research on your disease, if they mention it in the abstract, but usually at least the disease is mentioned, perhaps not the gene or all the details. Okay. But that would be the way to do it. And we can sort of step you a little bit through it. So we could do that maybe after. And this is for all of NIH, or this is NINDS? This is NIH. Okay. okay. So these They're are, in like a whole bunch of different yeah. areas. And then you can select the fiscal year and all that. So, okay. But Thank you know, you. one thing to remember, of course, for instance, in ALS, it's not only NIH that funds research on the disease. For instance, the Department of Defense has very active programs, or the Department of Veterans Health, the VA, mm -hmm. or Veterans Administration, sorry. So, on, um, for instance, in ALS, although the CDC has some activities, so when you sort of think about the landscape, it's more than just NIH and the federal government. Not always, but at least for some of the diseases. Just by way of explanation, I was going to say that um, when a researcher writes an abstract, um, it's before the, before the research is getting done, and we don't always know where that research is going to take us, and the grants go for like five years. So if you're looking at an abstract, um, you know, it could have been written five years ago. Um, maybe they should be updated along the line, I don't know, but, you know, they usually don't get updated, and that's sort of why yeah. <laughs> we try to write them in a kind of general way that's going to uh, basically describe, you know, what we're doing through the whole time of the grant. Could I just add one, and then we'll go to your question. So I think um, one um, change that has happened at NIH in terms of sharing research results, if you um, publish a paper that is based on funding from the NIH, you now fall on the, it's called the NIH Public Access Policy. So NIH has established relationships with journals and um, the publishing houses. So at least after a 12-month embargo, all of the research articles that were supported by NIH um, dollars must be made available to the public, and you can then retrieve them to the NCBI, it's the PubMed um, central database, and you can get access to the full article. There is a 12-month lag for some of the journals, but at least we pushed it that far that um, ultimately the research results will be available to the public because these are tax dollar, taxpayers' dollars that made the research possible. So that has been a very recent change, and I think it's a good direction. Yeah, a PubMed. That's probably, yeah, yeah. So, but anybody can search PubMed, and you can yeah. search on a disease and find out, um, yeah. you know, investigators anywhere in the world that are working on that uh, disease and publishing on it. Yeah. So we have one more comment. Thank you. Um, this is sort of an observation, I think, mixed with a question as well. I think NINDS has something like 600 diseases in your portfolio, and you said that you had 200 and some odd uh, disease condition right listed. So I, I just want to comment on the disconnect because um, representing a disease with very small incidents and there was some discussion about really analyzing the portfolio and I, I'll say in advance that I recognize that you want to fund the best research and I support that wholeheartedly. However, I guess two questions. Are there any analyses of um, you know, are all diseases getting some funding mm -hmm. in some shape or form? And what about the other 400 diseases that aren't potentially on that list 
That's sort of the question. The point is how can we drive more researchers in that direction because I feel for those folks that don't have people that know the system or can work the system or have the resources to get funding. And then the second question or comment really relates to is there any analysis being done by the amount of money that's being spent related to incidents? So there are some diseases that have terrific representation and I'm, I'm not trying to create a disease war. I don't want to pit one disease against the other. I think you know every single condition in this room and, and there on um, have merit. But it does concern me um, to see that there's probably an inequitable amount of money being spent on those diseases that have representation, that have organizations, that have um, research communities that are advocating versus the ones that aren't. And can we as a community look for ways to drive research into those diseases that are underrepresented? I think these are all really excellent thoughts, and I'll comment on them. Just one note for Marion. Did anyone least lose his or her cell phone? It's at the registration. So if you have, please let us know or go out. And um, so sort of the whole idea of underfunded disease areas, I think that's really, really important. Actually, a few years ago, we had sort of a strategic planning effort at NINDS, and that was one of the topics that we discussed. So what if in one disease area, there perhaps is actually pretty sort of broad um, prevalence, there are absolutely no grants. And we think about this actually quite actively. We need the nonprofit groups for this, but um, not um, uncommonly, we do have um, workshops or meetings to stimulate um, research in a specific areas. Sometimes we have specific program announcements, but we often just start with a workshop. And um, again, I guess it's, um, you know, sometimes a disease, there isn't, even though it's a big problem, there isn't a lot of scientific opportunity there yet. And this is when we really need to work with the nonprofit groups to sort of start the research enterprise and then sort of to, sm to start in small steps. And if we just have sort of a little bit knowledge, then we can sort of start building a program. But I think that's when it's really important to have the partnerships between us and you. But I do agree that, you know, sometimes there may be imbalances. Did you have another question also? Yeah. Is there any analysis on incidents versus spend? So we try a little bit to stay away from these hard numbers. So for instance, this is a really relevant topic to ALS. So the CDC actually built a registry. Um, they started in 2008 and they had the first um, release of data this summer. You know, how many people um, suffer from this devastating disease? And based on their estimates, actually the numbers are a little bit lower than we thought. So um, the numbers that um, they always cited by everybody was about 30,000 um, patients, and now we learn it's about only half. But for me, because it's only half of the number of patients, it's not a less important research area because it's such a devastating disease. And also right now there are a lot of scientific opportunities because just over the last three, four years, we have found new disease genes, new pathologies. There's really a lot that we can do right now to move things forward and even to help these 12,000 patients who may, you know, have, um, who may um, pass away in a very, very short time through a horrible disease. So just going by numbers, it's very difficult because every disease is so different. And I think it's sort of the burden of the disease. And I know there are analyses about it. I don't think we have anything sort of publicly available, but we do think about that. And I think these are important questions. Mona and then Jane. So I think that's a great question too. So the area that I've been overseeing is traumatic brain injury. And that is a huge incidence, just huge. And um, yet many, many, many people actually do recover pretty well. So the people in the TBI field also feel it's underfunded because they feel like they have this huge incidence and proportionally it's you know, underrepresented. So I think Amelie really got to it. It's, it is a complicated question because it really gets into kind of the burden and um, they, they do you know, run numbers on societal costs and stuff to try to give us some um, perspectives, but um, so I think it's a good 
question. I think everyone in a way feels as though their area is somewhat underrepresented, and that's what I guess I was mostly trying to say. But I think the point Jane made earlier about um, maybe banding together, and I don't know your area, so I don't know if there's any groups that there's some sort of commonalities, but I think that to me really would kind of make sense. You know, Lynn Jakeman, who's in here, she's a program director for spinal cord injury, and so I have traumatic brain injury, and there's actually lots of things that can be learned together. You know, there's similarities, so we try to sometimes exploit opportunities where one of us is doing something and then has, you know, so it just, there is sort of power in, in pulling stuff together. So I guess that would be my suggestion. I don't know if that resonates, because um, you always hate to give someone a suggestion that just they've thought about it and it won't work, but. The workshop thing is a really good uh -huh. way to get started, because it's a way to work with the NINDS, raise the attention, but attract the investigators too, because it's an NINDS co-sponsored uh -huh. sponsored work. So that's a nice way to get started. And I do quite a number of these. So earlier this year, um, I worked with two other program directors. We did a workshop on gene therapy, but it wasn't for a specific disease. We sort of tried to capture all neuromuscular diseases. So it was ALS, spinal muscular dystrophy, uh, spinal muscular atrophy, and the muscular dystrophies. And it was, it was actually really fun getting these um, investigators from slightly different disease areas together to tackle one problem. How could we sort of make gene therapy work for these diseases? So so um, I think the workshop concept is really great and it also then helps you to partner with other disease groups and work from one another and then also interact with NIH. Jane, I think you wanted, Jane, did you want to say something? Yeah. I just wanted to make one major point. Um, we largely live in an investigator-initiated world, so it's a matter of increasing the number of applications that come yeah. into the NIH with the hope that more of them will be successful. Ever since the fiscal crisis hit, we are protecting our pay lines like crazy. Every yeah. NIH institute is doing that. And in order to keep the scientific community just engaged, overall is very, very difficult right now because the pay lines are so low. So if you start to parse it out for every disease, you may actually lose like a whole generation of scientists. So um, that's where we're focused. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's a really good point. Thanks, Jane. Yeah. And then we'll I probably should have said this at the get-go. I'm wearing a couple of different hats here today. As I mentioned, I'm a parent. I'm the founder of Hope for Hypothalamic Hamartomas, but I'm also one of the patient advocates sitting on the NINDS Advisory Council. So in many ways, I, I represent all the voices in this room, and I just wanted to mention that so that to encourage you to seek me out. I'll be happy to share my information so that if you have um, you know, information that you want me, I feel like I'm representing each of your constituencies, as well as those 600 other underrepresented disease groups, I can't help but think, and this was a large part of why I accepted that council position, mm -hmm. that there really is, the system is in, that is in place um, is doing a disservice to many of the conditions in an NINDS, and I know that's sort of boiling the ocean issue, and I, I really do appreciate your comments about working together. HH is a form of epilepsy, so we partner you know, ad nauseum with all the other epilepsy organizations to try to find synergies to make sure that we're taking best advantages of resources. And I'm not in any way suggesting that we pit diseases or that, um, you know, that we compromise or undermine the, re the good research that's being done. But sitting at that council meeting, and I've now been to a year's worth, and coming to these meetings, it is very frustrating to think about the 400 organizations that are not here mm -hmm. and that will not have a workshop because they don't know to ask for it and yeah. you know and will not have research because they don't have anybody out there that's trying to stimulate research in those areas and really trying to figure out how we can improve upon the system to to make that access to those funds which are critical to transform those diseases much more broadly available than the same old, same old that we see come yeah. through the doors time and again. And they're coming through the doors because they have the infrastructures have in place to, to be able to access it. Yeah, I mean, you know, we try to make ourselves as available as possible. We can't really pick diseases and say, you know, you submit an R13. I mean, you know, it has to come to us, but then we really want to encourage it and be available. Please, and we had a yeah. question over here, right? Yeah. Shall we go there first? 
I just wanted to thank you for your uh, comments and to say that um, this is an important time to be raising those issues because of exome sequencing and finding so many more um, disease genes now. And um, we'll be going next weekend and the following weekend to Children's National to be with um, groups of people whose uh, genes have just been discovered and to you know try to help them start through the process. So I, I, I think your comments are very timely. One more comment and I'll give it to you. Um, we started, we recognize that PMD is a leukodystrophy. We started working with an organization to bring eight organizations together called the United Leukodystrophy Association and started working with an organization of eight institutions, they're calling it GLIA, Global Leukodystrophy Initiative. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to work out how all those people can work together for a larger voice. At the moment, PMD speaks for 250 patients in the entire US. For all leukodystrophies, there are now 30 of them. And we're now represented approximately one in 8,000 if we're talking together as a larger voice. So the question is how we might come together working with such a meeting. What's the there? The question is how do we work together? Uh, yeah. This is where we might take it as a, as a question we might answer here, but we can talk about how it's going to So I'm going to try to have this a couple of comments evolve into a question, but it might just come out as some confusion, so I apologize. <laughs> right. and, I and, and, and actually, I actually think it's interesting that, that the state of this sector and everyone in this room is probably not poorly given a metaphor by the fact that you saw I wanted the microphone, someone else was using it, it stopped there, then you had something to say and it finally came to me, which is fine, but there's so much to be said. Yeah. <laughs> And, and additionally, what, what I struggle with is, you know, we give away, you know, 2 million plus a year. But the NIH gives away 18 million a year for CP. Mm -hmm. Seems, you know, th there are enough people with cerebral palsy that it could be a lot more than $18 million. So do I spend my $2 million seeding other people's work? Or do I spend it just bringing advocates to Congress? <laughs> and advocates to the NIH and getting young investigators. You know, we all come up with the Young Investigator Grant, which makes an awful lot of sense. And, and again, you know, if you can focus the scientific world on your specific problem, then you'll get a lot of energy. And what you said in terms of investigator, that, that much of the research is investigator-led, and investigators tend to go to something that they find scientifically interesting. My wife runs a cancer research lab, and she moved to a mouse model, and she's studying the genetics of ovarian and endometrial cancer. And I know from her that like a half a million dollars would be a lot of money. <laughs> and some of the most amazing studies can come by giving someone $100,000 to make a lab go. All they need is a couple of mice, a couple of, you know, gyroscopes, is that what they're called? And, you know, centrifuges. And, and you know, they can come up. Like, I'm an advertising guy, so my whole life in advertising. My son has cerebral palsy. And, and, and interestingly enough, what I did first was create technology, a speech device that was cooler and hipper, so it changed the conversation and gave people with cerebral palsy social capital. So instead of going up like Stephen Hawking with eh, 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 and a big thing in front of your face, oh, which I is cool this. if you're Stephen Hawking, but not if you're a five-year-old, it, it was a cool thing. It had some SpongeBob SquarePants, and it had a lot of digitized voices. And that was easy for me because I knew exactly what I wanted to build and that technology was there and I had to innovate and bundle things in a way no one had done before, but at the end of the day I could hold something up. Cerebral palsy is crazily complex because we don't even know why it happens. Some people say there's genetics that happen, some people, you know, my son was asphyxia at birth, um, and cerebral palsy is anything from having a small wiggle in your hand to being totally unable to move and speak. So we have this crazily complex condition you know, and I wish we could just do some, you know, we could just say there's a gene we have to work on or a chromosome, we figured out what it is, and, and I know how hard that is. So my question, and the last thing, when I was on the NIDCD, they were kind enough to allow me to do the, the last talk, and it was called The Magic of Science, from the aha in the lab to the oh my God in the world. And the notion was that when someone like me looks at the science in the NIH, it's this ivory tower that I can't begin to understand. 
And yet, these guys who are creating these cochlear implants and who can tell me that the lining of the stomach connects to the lining of the tongue don't realize what it's like when someone can hear the first time because <laughs> they're so involved in the science of it. Sometimes the notion that a mother you know, is going to break down in tears because a kid can hear for the first time. So it's bringing all that together. So the question is, everyone in this room has limited money, whether it's $100,000 or $3 million. You know, how do you best spend that to not advance what you think is right, but what a field needs to actually move toward some answers, given that there's a timeline for most of these things that are genetic that you, know, you don't know if you're going to get an answer. And I hope that came up like a question and not complete confusion, because it is, it's, it's hard to deal with these things. You know, I mean, my, my, just to seem not unfocused, you know, what we're doing is we're trying to accelerate the delivery of scientific advancement. So what we're trying to look at are things that are close and getting them out there. For CP, there's a lot of therapeutic advance that is so close to being released. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of the medicine that needs to just move forward a little bit. So we're spending our dollars to sort of just get things across the finish line. And that seems smart for us because it's immediate change versus things that would be more long term. Yeah, you know, I think for every disease, it's sort of different and it sort of depends on your preference where you think your investment is sort of the biggest bang for the buck, right? And I think it really depends. And I mean, we kind of just have to stay away from the advocacy topic. We can't really, you know, as government employees. But um, I think it's sort of your personal decision where you think you can have the biggest impact. And what I really like about non for profit groups, you have the connectivity with the patients. I mean, it's so different if you know the patient, if the patient is your child. And unfortunately, I mean, you know, at NIH, we are not completely removed from the diseases at all, but still it's different. We sit at our desk in the office. And, um, and I think that's sort of an advantage. And then we, you can also sort of, you know, directly learn from the patients what is meaningful for them or you observe, you know, what makes a difference. Lynn, did you want to? Yeah, so I, I kind of wanted to address that point um, because there, there is real value to maintaining this conversation between your program officers in, in your disease area that are covering your disease areas um, and your organization um, that we've certainly you know, been able to do in the spinal cord injury field and I think in other fields. And that is that, that because of the way that our grants are solicited and because of the way that our grants are, are reviewed and funded, our hands are tied as well in terms of trying to pick and choose the most innovative, the most promising, like, you know, the kinds of things you're discussing. But we kind of know where those gaps are. And we can't discuss with you the grants that didn't succeed, of course. But we can tell you, you know, how our review process occurs and what's happening with some of the more innovative grants. Um, and I have a good relationship with, um, with one of the, the, well, actually two of the foundations for spinal cord injury. And I can talk to them a little bit about, you know, what, what's going, what we can't do. Our hands are tied a lot because of the bureaucracy that we're working with and because of the, the rigorous peer review process that we go through because of just sheer numbers of applicants. You know, if you guys had the numbers of applicants that we do, it, it, you'd have the same problem. So I can, I can help you figure out, you know, where we're getting stuck at our end and you might see gaps that maybe you didn't know about. Somebody gave me some life-changing advice. <laughs> we were struggling. We have a strategic plan for science, and we could look at the return on investment on these potential projects, and out of 1,000 projects, 990 of them would have yielded a fabulous return on investment. There are just too many projects and too many needs in our community to try to figure it out. There's just so much that needs to be done. So finally, <laughs> uh, one of the VP of Translational Science at Autism Speaks told me, what's not going to happen if you don't do it? And I thought that that really was life-changing for me because it made me think, you know, we've got other funders. We have the NIH. We have other private funders. We have industry investment. We've got these other places that could potentially fund a lot of the projects that need to be done. So use your influence where you can to in encourage them to fund your science. And then look at really what are the gap areas, not just the gap areas for your entire field, but that you specifically can make some difference in. That's actually part of the decision process. Yeah, I think that's really excellent. I was just going to say, I had heard you say that um, some, of your re some of the researchers um, don't really know the impact um, that it has on the patients because they're sort of in their space. But one thing you can do as a funder of research is you can get the patients and the researchers connected 
Mm -hmm. um, we have research advocates that sit on our grant review panels, and for every large grant that we do, for summer fellows, for our postdoctoral fellows, larger ones, we have them there giving their opinions on what they think, you know, from a patient's perspective is good. And then we also, for the young investigators, um, the ones that are local, you know, we'll give them um, workshops on how to present their research to a lay audience, and then we'll have them present at an event where we have people with Parkinson's that come so they can interact with them and be able to, then you're sort of, you know, for the young investigators, you're sort of not breeding anew, but you're helping to um, give them another view of this while they're doing their research so that it makes it even more important to them. So. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, um, your research will be, you might have less money than NIH does to give towards your research, but it's a unique way because you're, do, right. you're able to get your researchers connected mm -hmm. with the people, um, you know, that they're actually working to, you know, to help, which not everyone gets to do. Yeah. Okay, so we had a comment over there and back there. I don't know who was first. Okay, the lady. Oh. Which? Okay. You want, okay, it's, John, it's yeah. Here now. yeah. You can. Go ahead. Okay, so I have uh, uh, been able to do something that's a little bit unique. Um, we know the Kennedy Disease Association knows personally most of the people working on what we're doing, are, are what, what we're about. And we've been able to fund smaller amounts for people who need it just to get over the hump and let them know that they don't have to go through a process. It can be a simple ask. And it can be people doing business with people they know. The secret is to know them. Over there. Jane, over there. Which one? Oh. Thanks. OK, so I've got now a point for each person <laughs> that spoke. Um, at the ABTA, we um, ask that our investigators come back and do their reporting of their outcomes at a patient meeting. And we hear back from the um, researchers that that's a very powerful moment for them. A lot of them in the labs don't have the access to the patients that are struggling with the disease that they're working on. So it's a nice way to kind of bring them together and also send them back with, you know, the inspiration to keep on researching in that area. And then Second, I wanted to ask if there's a way, I know you can't advocate or kind of talk about the unfunded grants, but those ones that are close to the pay line that you think foundations can kind of pick up the slack, is there any way to, to feed that? Is that a conversation that we have with program directors? Or? So on rare occasions, we've sort of worked with groups and they sort of um, told us that they would be willing to um, consider the funding of applications that just missed the pay line. I know we have done it in one or two disease areas. It really sort of depends on the nonprofit groups coming to, to us mm -hmm. that they want to do this. And then secondly, the investigators, um, they must agree to um, share their application or the summary statement, so that's the critique from the reviewers with the private group. So usually that's confidential. So the investigators, they, um, you know, they must agree that they um, would be willing to share um, the critique with the non-for-profit group. So on occasion, we do that. Um, not a lot of groups, I think, have pursued this, but it's certainly a way that is possible because in this way, sort of NIH does the peer review for you. I don't think we'll, we would be able to do that across the board for all diseases, but there are some examples. Jane, did you have an example? Yeah, that? I wonder if you could actually solicit it, like on your foundation site. The problem is, is that you're gonna get 
the maybe the loudest voices, but not the best science. Yeah. So that's where it would be nice if you could see everything across the board. And I think John Porter. So he has done that, and he, then an, he shared the, where, and yeah. Mark Sutherland. They yeah. have shared then the critique from the reviewers with the scientific staff of the foundation, and then so basically, <coughs> then they can see whether this is actually very meritorious science. And usually it is because our pay line is so stringent that there's still a lot of good science that we unfortunately can't fund in a given year. So that's certainly something to pursue or sort of have a conversation about with your program director. Okay. And then I just have one, one other question kind of for the group. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, if there's so much seed money and so much young investigator um, money out there that as we kind of develop these relationships with our young investigators and follow them throughout their careers, they get to another point and they want transition grants and they want those, you know, kind of maybe a smaller or less time or less kind of restrictive grant than a fellowship would be to just kind of get them through that independent phase as the academic um, kind of form starts to tighten their requirements on who they'll hire and where they can be successful and independent. It, is it worth kind of not abandoning the um, young investigator side, but is there enough out there for them to get those funds elsewhere where it would make sense to kind of build up a career, but then you're with these investigators. I mean, that's a true investment to stay with them throughout their career. Is this something anyone in the audience has, has done? Yeah. So actually, I do think that NIH does pay a lot of attention to this. So um, for early stage investigators, so these are principal investigators who are just starting their lab, we do have a somewhat more flexible pay line and we really want to have, give them a little bit help um, when they start out their labs. But we do know that for them a really de a career determinant event is five years later after they've had their first year for five years they need to renew it. And we do pay a lot of attention to these grants and sometimes we try to help these investigators because you know it is um, very challenging then to sort of maintain your funding um, you know, throughout your career and especially sort of after the first five years or so. So we certainly um, try to pay attention to this and of course um, non-profit funding for investigators even if they have run their lab for a couple of years will still be extremely helpful because again it will help you to compete more successfully at NIH. And we were just joined by um, Bob Finkelstein who is also from NINDS, he's a director. Maybe um, Bob, do you want to comment on this? Going back to the case stage, um, Amelie was talking about the person who's already a principal investigator, but going back to the training grants, even though because of the federal budget, our pay line has dropped enormously over the last 15 years from, at NIDS it used to be about the 26th percentile, and now it's down to 14, and it actually had gone lower than that. Um, we have not decreased our funding lines for K awards. So we're still funding essentially the same fraction of K applications as we were when the pay line was much higher. So in a, in a sense, we are making it somewhat easier for people to get a K award. Now, I understand that there are still plenty of good people who would like a K award and probably should have one who don't get it. And if you're, if you're part of a, a patient group that's lucky enough to have money, that's one good way to spend it, to get somebody started off. But the bump we give, once somebody gets a K award and then eventually or independently gets a, a new investigator award, the bump that we give new investigators is really pretty enormous. Mm -hmm. when, our, when our pay line is about 14 or 15th percentile, we've been funding people up to the 30th percentile. Uh, no, I'm, now I'm talking about R01s. Okay. The Ks, the Ks um, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. As Steve isn't here, is he? No. no but th as I said, the, uh, the fraction of Ks getting funded has actually not gone down in step with the budget. Um, but in terms of R01s, if you can get to the point of writing your first R01 application, the bump is enormous. But as Amelie said, it's the second R01 mm -hmm. that now is becoming the rate limiting step, and that's when people are up for tenure, so it's a very right. difficult time.
You're funding only a few, um, you know, young investigators. And so just the probability of those specific people getting funding afterwards is going to be low unless you're funding hundreds over years and can really follow them. And so that's what we're running into now is that, and I think someone else already brought this up, but is it better to be funding an established investigator who's a great mentor who has already the track record of helping their people mm -hmm. get past those first steps or funding uh, you know young investigators from multiple labs that may be coming from a small lab but you're not sure you know where it's really going to go to periodically, you know, and, and each organization make the decision when it's time to do this, but reevaluate your strategic plan and reevaluate the landscape of your science. Science probably doesn't move as fast as any of us want it to move in this room, but it does move. And so I think it's really important to reevaluate that landscape fairly often to mm -hmm. see where you're at because it may behoove you some years to invest more, if you, relatively speaking, in young investigator mm -hmm. awards, but it may behoove you in other years not to do that and go with more stuff. If, say, you want a high throughput screening assay mm -hmm. and you want to invest in there, then you may want to do an RFA that's going to call for more experienced investigators. Yeah. So, where you going? so this question is kind of shifting gears entirely away from this topic. I, I don't know if anybody wants to go back to the funding yeah, question. Minutes. Okay, <laughs> so the question is, um, the peer-reviewed process is so integral to who gets funded and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. How, um, if, and this might be naive because I'm sort of new to this, but how, how are the peer reviewers selected? And the reason I'm asking is because, um, like our condition that we fund, POTS, is fairly common but really not well known. I could walk into 100 neurology offices in the US and have like one doctor know what it is. Mm -hmm. So if the peer review panels reflect like the general knowledge of the condition, how are those reviewers, uh, when they're reading a grant application about POTS, if they don't really know, like how do we know they know about it enough to yeah. make a reasoned judgment? Yeah, I mean, I think this is an excellent question. And of course, this is something that NIH pays a lot of attention to, and I think it's quite debated. But um, usually it's NIH-funded investigators who are at a slightly more mature career stage, and, and they are supposed to have the subject matter expertise to serve on that particular panel. Of course, if your disease is ultra rare, there may be only so many researchers out there who know the disease, but we kind of hope that they're smart enough and that they'll inform you know, themselves, read the science, which they should understand, to be able to judge an application. So I think um, the Center for Scientific Review, who handles most of the study sections, or these review panels, not all, they're trying to do the best they can. It's probably not perfect, but I think it's a pretty good system. And again, I have colleagues here who probably have more experience than me but to comment on this. Does NIH bring in ad hoc reviewers, people who really have the yeah. in-depth knowledge and feel to say, you know, this is critical, or, hey, yeah. you know, they missed this in their experiment. I mean, yeah. how often does NIH do that? Do they? Yeah, they quite often. And sometimes if you have special program announcements, they will convene special panels. They're probably for the print initiative, right? They, 
um, built a special panel just for those announcements. So there is some flexibility but it's there. With a specific announcement, right? So if there's a some with an RFA, RFA, yeah. Then they'll bring in no, no, also to the standing yeah. study, study sections. Study so, and also um, the NINDS um, runs quite a few study sections, especially um, for clinical trials or some translational projects. And our scientific review officers, they pay a lot of attention to this, and they often bring in ad hoc reviewers to discuss a specific application. So it's certainly be something we do quite a bit. So, so it's 10 o'clock now. I think we really had a fascinating, um, really interactive discussion. So thank you all for your comments. It was really helpful for me. And I hope that you all will continue to interact amongst one another and also with us. Thank you.